It's good seeing you again. So, good morning, and really, really, really thank you. I cannot tell you how, how glad that uh, you, you finally wanted to come back on and, and endure the torment and the possibility <laughs> of strange UK spies and things being thrown at you in the middle of the night. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I have, I have, as as you know, as I, every other email I get is where's Joseph. So, um, with that ado, and mm -hmm. everybody, please bear with me. I've lost my voice. I got a bit of a fever, so I'm I'm not thinking my usually slowness. I'm slower than usually slow, but here we are. And maybe <clears throat> in a, in a minute or less, you could sum up what's wrong with the Western world and how do we fix it. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll start with something simple simple um <laughs> small things what's wrong with the western <laughs> world is is it is unable to answer the question how much progress is enough you and we have all progressed ourselves we have yes to the yes. evolution of progress right on a human right. level isn't it right. isn't this it's 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 the late enlightenment gone completely off the rails as you know people were telling them back during the enlightenment you know uh that's that's the problem um it's become essentially an anti-religious an anti anti-christian anti common sense anti transcendental values i mean every every traditional institution it, it is basically an anti-human trend. It's an anti-human trend. Alt because, yeah, it's, that's it in a nutshell. And it's interesting because I, I don't want to want to get back a little bit to to religion afterwards as, as the mm -hmm. antidote to this because if you look through the progress graphs mm -hmm. of history of the past hundreds of years, when technology have advanced, there's been a, a, a decrease in interest in religion. Yes. And. <clears throat> what we're seeing now is almost an outright hostility towards religion in some western countries oh yeah Depend, depending on the religion depending on the well it's mostly christianity i think and then secondarily uh secondarily judaism in europe uh right now anti-islam in in certain circles for understandable reasons but i think i think you put you hit the nail on the head that basically you know this is anti-human and what's driving what's driving the the progressivist or the technocrat or the oligarchy or what have you, whatever you want to call it. I, managerial I globalists. Yeah, the managerial globalists. What's driving them is I think a form of nihilism and many of them are are so incredibly blockheadedly colossally somersaultingly stupid that they they cannot recognize the fact that what they've bought into is nihilism that's in a nutshell but joseph tell me how you really feel uh, um <laughs> don't hold back um Please. listen i listen patino i am holding back uh i think you know me well enough to know that if we weren't being recorded my 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 little French grandmother's French would start coming out in full flower <laughs> because I can hear her now just, you know, saying something in the kind of French you don't learn in school. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny. That's the only the first French word I learned was never mind. Um, yeah, I learned that <laughs> same word, too, from my grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that, But is, isn't it interesting that we are right back to having to watch the fence of the conversation yes you no longer have free speech no. because we we can't even have an open completely honest conversation no. because oh you don't know who like and in england like you look at what's going on in england they're actually physically locking people up in prison uh, for a tweet or a statement yeah. or this is very much a thin end of the wedge it's the it's, thin end of the wedge and what bothers me is and you know this as well as i do you can vote these these people in, but you seldom can vote them out. You have to shoot them out. Yes, unfortunately, and that's the problem. Uh, we're at we're at a we're at an inflection point in in the history of the West. 
Uh, and if if we if we don't negotiate our way through this, and and you can see it everywhere. We saw it in the French election. We're seeing it in this country's election. We saw it in the last election in the United Kingdom. We've got elections coming up. I'm I'm almost certain the German government's not long for this world. Um, so you know, I, who knows where Schultz is, uh, what planet he's on? But uh, yeah. Um, um, you know, when, when the most sane leaders in the world are Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin, then we've yes. got a problem, folks. <laughs> <laughs> we've got a very big problem. <laughs> it's interesting when you think that the World War I governments who got us all into World War I are still smarter than the people who have today. That's rather troubling. And that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's quite a comparison. To right, right? <laughs> but you are right. I mean, if you if you thought the Habsburgs and the Hohenzollerns and the Romanovs were, were a bunch of stumbling, doddering fools, they they were competent. They were compared, compared to these standards. Honestly, yeah, I it, mean, it just boggles the mind. It's it's. <laughs> it, I mean, basically, basically, World War One practically started because of of the managerials in between yes. couldn't. It was a very small group of people who got World War One off the ground. It because was a very the small group of people. And by the way, let, since you bring up World War One and that managerial class of nutcases, I I personally think if you really want a case study in in that class, absolutely not knowing what they're doing, look at that class and how they engineered Britain's entry, and for that matter, everybody else. Yes, to get into World War One. Because you've got Lord Milner and and that whole Salisbury Cecil Rhodes circle in the United Kingdom of, yeah. you know the the upper crust that's kind of hovering on on the periphery of the of of the Royal Privy Council and they're the ones making and fashioning British policy, and they manage you know their big fear is uh oh we've got to prevent Germany from you know becoming the ascendant power in Europe and we're not strong enough to do that so let's get everybody else in Europe yes. to fight Germany <laughs> yes <laughs> which is what basically happened I, and I think this is the same crew it is the same insane group of that are going to take this little island into a nuclear war with Russia. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay, Britain, take your 270 thermonuclear warheads and multiply that. By, you know, it's insanity. Totally. Do, do, you think, insanity. Do, do, you, do you think that's the, the, the theory that we are, we at this point in time being Britain, America not far behind? Right. We are so they are so close to a civil war that we may as well start a third war as to have a common enemy to maybe we'll keep our own hinterland from tearing itself apart. Oh, I this is a distraction. I think I think this is absolutely now in in the calculus of of the power elite in the West, and here's why. If you look if you look at the situation globally, there there are actually sociologists that are are following this phenomenon worldwide you know we look we look at marine le pen in france and think oh well that's just an isolated you know right wing nutcase in france and they've always been a little strange you know and so we don't we don't need to worry what's really happening is that same populist movement is not just in france it's in spain it's in italy it's in austria the netherlands germany poland Hungary, the United Kingdom. It's in this country. It's in Canada. It's in South America. It's in India. And yep. you can even find traces of it in China. It's in Japan. This is a global phenomenon. People are fed up with their political elite. And that's exactly what it is. It is a reaction to what it they did. Yes. And that's what they don't understand. Well, the problem The problem is, is the 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 Every populist revolt has something in common, and and we're watching it. You know, we we're, we have just seen a leading left wing Democrat, Bobby Kennedy, come out and endorse the Republican kind of center right candidate for president, and followed up by yet another Democrat with Tulsi Gabbard. And what that should tell people 
is that the, there is a realignment between the the political and leadership class and everybody else. It yes. is no longer a right versus left. It's a top versus a bottom. Yeah. Realignment. This is the problem. And the the political elite in the West is kooky and crazy and stupid enough to mm -hmm. do anything to hang on to their power yeah. in that situation, including, as you suggest, to avoid civil war, well, let's start a global war. Yes. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, I, we narrowly, you know, I just have, I have a book right now. I just submitted to the publisher about the American Civil War. And we narrowly avoided in this country when we were fighting the Civil War, having that blow up and escalate into a global war. Because everybody in Europe, all the European powers, were watching what was happening in this country and were poised on the brink of intervention. And, you know, that would have been <laughs> really bad, you know, had it happened. But, but I, think, I think the dangers now are, are, are even more dangerous and, 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 and the risk factor has gone up, Tino, for one very important reason. It's that managerial class that you talked about. Yeah. We, don't even, we don't have a functioning constitutional republic right now. No. What we have is a banana republic, and we yes. have a government by avatar and and hidden oligarchy and hidden politburo. That's what we have. It's just that's the word I was looking for. Thank you. Yeah, it, that's what we have. It is a politburo. You know, and, yeah. and and even you know, here's the problem: even the politburo in the Soviet Union and Communist China, you at least knew who they were. Yes. <laughs> you know? You didn't have to worry about voting for them. You but didn't you have to worry were. about voting. You know, it's like that Stalin movie, All in Favor. Everybody, you know, you know unanimously <laughs> cared. 99% um, of the vote again. 99% of the vote again. Isn't that a miracle, everybody? Yeah. How, how popular our great leader is. But, <laughs> but this, the problem we have now is nobody knows who's really in charge. And that's yeah. a bad, as you know, Tino, that's a bad situation because it's also likely that they don't really know in the Kremlin and they don't really know in the Forbidden City in Beijing and the Imperial Palace in Tokyo and so on and so on and so on. That is correct. Um, uh, we, we have taken upon ourselves to be the world leaders and try to meddle about around the yeah. world. But if there's no one left in charge of this meddling, yeah. how do you pull ahead? Who do you call? Well, the uh, other the other problem with the meddling, as you pointed out earlier, is we're doing it all in the name of some sort of uh, moral crusade. And you know, I'm I'm an old Southern partisan. I can smell a Yankee having a moral crusade. <laughs> you know, okay, you want to abolish slavery? Fine, good. Give us a plan. Give us a plan. We're How are you going to do it? Not, not. They, yeah, they did it in Russia under the czars. Yes. They it, didn't do it here. We had to fight a war. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And the only plan that they finally came out with was Abraham Lincoln in 1862. And at that point, the Congress votes him down. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's also it's also easy to free the slaves in the uh, in the air con in the non conquered air yeah, areas. You, not yeah, we're yet. freeing all you guys, but <laughs> but not up here. <laughs> I mean, the, the Confederates had slaves fighting in their army, in their armed, army, while Lincoln's army was never allowed to be armed until the very very end. Oh, it's it's just nuts. <laughs> yeah, I know this. You know, yeah. I, the whole thing is so nuts. But but my problem is, like you point out, if we're going to go on a moral crusade, at least give us a Billy Graham to lead it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Let us know who's in charge here. <laughs> This is more uh, like like the, the 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 lemming bureaucrats yes, that have it, decided it, it, on a plan for themselves. This yes, and you know <clears throat> the next five months, I, I'm with you, Tino. We could literally be in a world war, and yeah. and and these nut. Here's my other problem. Here's my other problem. Do go on. <laughs> you knew this would happen. <laughs> <laughs> No, I my have other to to you. Look, I, I have never served in the military, 
ever. I've read a lot of history. I've played a lot of war games. I have kind of a basic feel on what you do and what you don't do. What you don't do is invade Russia with 3,000 people in Kursk, create a salient that you can't supply, <laughs> and subject even that to constant Russian interdiction with precision weapons that are space guided and everything else while you're reliant on the good wishes of Swampington DC. That's, yeah, that's problem that's problem number one. That's the latter problem being the biggest problem. Yeah, that's what you don't do. But we've got so many people now. I, I'm thinking of Senator Lindsey Graham Cracker, this this hothead neocon nutcase from South Carolina that wants us to bomb Iran and go to war with Iran. Now, here's the bad thing, Mr. Graham. Have you ever consulted a map? Have you looked at the topography of Iran? Have you looked at the potential places where we could potentially invade that country and discover that there's a lot of mountains <laughs> and they're all right along the coast? So, so how are you going to do this, Lindsay? And once you get in there, how are you going to supply them? When Russia back to Iraq again. Yeah. You know, these people have no sense, none, no. zero, zilch, no, they of, really how to con of how to conduct any sort of modern military operation. And, you know, they, they, they want to get involved, and I'm thinking, how are you going to supply them? We don't even have the manufacturing base to supply enough 155 millimeter shells for the Ukraine. And that's yes. when we pool our resources with the United Kingdom and Germany. So <laughs> yeah. borrow from the Koreans. <laughs> yeah, yeah, borrow from the Koreans, you know, if they'll be kind enough to sell to us. And yeah. if I were the Koreans, I wouldn't be taking any dollars right now. <laughs> Can we get paid in gold, please? Yeah, can we get paid in gold? Yes, exactly. Uh, yeah, the the the, the Brex idea of, of having a currency that's based on production is not a bad idea. Just no, too bad we eroded our own production base so terribly ever since the mid '90s that we we are not producing most of our own stuff. Yeah, well, the money <laughs> the money debate in in the West right now is is another case in point of our absolute insanity. Because yes, if you're going to have if you're going to have a production based debt free uh, currency based on on surplus production, if that's the kind of currency you have, it's a it's a good currency system to have. It's a good idea. Yeah. The Union used it during the Civil War, yeah. and it worked. Um, the problem is you got to produce something, as you point out. Oh, that. When, yeah, and if you if you're not producing something, then everybody else is going to demand specie from you, and you know that drains your gold reserves, and you're still you're back where you started. So this this insanity in the West is is off the charts. Now I do happen to think that somebody wanted this and deliberately engineered it all this way because nothing ever it. happens by accident. Nothing happens by accident. Nothing, and, that, and that's interesting because that's one of the things I, I wanted to try to figure out: where does this beast come from? Because the the, the comparison to World War One, I, I think, is very apt these days. Oh yes, World War One started because of relatively few people. World War Two generally started because a relatively few people few pushed people. it in that direction. The Ukraine War probably started because of relatively few people. So the concept of starting a World War Three because very few people have an agenda to do so as, right. as a part, possibly, this is a theory. Mm -hmm. Their great reset of 2030, where we will own nothing and be happy, like uh, Swab said, which <laughs> is basically a conceptualized by the World Economic Forum, and the, the UN is pushing these things under, under the guise of equality and environment and all these nonsense things. Mm -hmm. All the things that comes with this is terrifying if you actually listen to what they say. And that's mm -hmm. the problem. No one mm -hmm. seems to be listening to what they say because eh, they say so much, it's just blanketed away. But mm -hmm. I'm thinking it seems a little bit like a woke world Marxist globalist agenda 2030. Because this seems like a new, 
Marxism started by going after the working class, have them rise up because they were unhappy. That didn't work in the West. It didn't work in America. You can't bring Marxists to America to, to, and then use the working classes because they're not really unhappy. They weren't unhappy in the 50s, 60s when this started. So what do you do? You have to go for the other unhappy minorities, sexual mm -hmm. identification minorities, mm -hmm. uh, the race theory, of course, is everything. And mm -hmm. you can start using the identity-based minorities as a different evolution of Marxism. Yes. Which is, I think, what we're seeing, because basically we have to find those who are unhappy, put them in charge of everything they're not in charge mm -hmm. of, uh, and then get and then it, destruction of everything that's normal. And isn't that pretty much what woke is? The yes. destruction of everything that is based normal, because they can then say we are discriminate against. But this is a globe. This is a global phenomenon pushed by again relatively few people who yes. have integrated education systems, governments economic institutions, BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard, who now owns all these and other institutions around the world, UN institutions. And you importantly, one institution you've forgotten where all this started, the churches. The churches. The churches. That, that's it's right. important for people to understand that the Cultural Revolution really begins right around the time of Vatican II, and Vatican II becomes its, its kind of the symbol of it. Um, what you're looking at is is the cultural Marxism theories of, of Antonio Gramsci and Herbert Marcuse and Theodore Adorno and people like this playing itself out. And it's it's particularly interesting that that, that cultural Marxism school, Marcuse and Theodore Adorno particularly, that, that flee Frankfurt and come over and ensconce themselves at the University of Columbia, and particularly in the education department. So in other words, it becomes a cancer that spreads to the academies in this country. And then you have you have the Rockefeller uh, family, as I like to call them, sponsoring all sorts of, of non-traditional ecumenical bullshit in, in the World Council of Churches and so on, and, and attempting deliberately to move uh, confessional bodies away from their doctrinal and, and traditional core. So all of this is going on at the same time. It's interesting to me that if you look at what Russia is doing to undo seven decades of Bolshevism, what are they doing? Well, they're building mosques and churches yeah. and synagogues. That's what they're doing. Uh, and, and doing it at a breathtaking pace when you compare what's going on there to what's going on here. So in other words, it's, it's like the Russians learned their cultural lesson and, and had to, to learn it the hard way. We haven't. And the problem that I see, Tino, is you, you raised the point of the Great Reset. And there's this big push on right now for cryptocurrency, central bank digital currency. And folks, uh, I, I'm going to echo Catherine Austin Fitz here. If you want a mark of the beast economic system, that's it. Yeah. Because you will lose complete control over your money because your money will no longer be money. It will be a corporate coupon that they can adjust the value of at the push of a button, depending on your quote unquote behavior. And That's by the way, what, you ate too much beef this week, so you can't bingo. buy anything next week. Bingo. Bingo. You traveled too far. You use too much carbon. You're taking up too much electric. On and on. They will not let us rest. And travel, you say, no, because now all the new cars have geofencing. So, yep. no, you're not going to travel if we don't like you to. And people don't seem to understand. If you have a car that's older than 2021, yep. the updates will have geofencing. Yep. All of them. Oh, yeah. And then we, if you, they don't want, and then manufacturers that will we'll never do that unless un, unless it's by your consent or if the government decrees so. Right. This right. is where the self-driving cars comes in. Complete right. control of the population. They yep. want a docile, stupid. Is this is this part of replacement theory? Yes. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Which I thought they're, is very. Here's here's the problem. Not only are these people fundamentally stupid and anti-human. They're putting into place policies that if this planet gets hit with certain types of emergencies, everything will collapse and they will not be able to stop it. True. That's their problem. And True. they don't, again, they don't see it. You know, we're dealing with people so insane, Tino, 
Bale Gates, again, pardon my nicknames for these people, but that's what I call him. Gates wants to blot out the sun on account of climate change. Now, okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That sounds like a good idea. Yeah, that uh, sounds like a completely good idea to me. Well, it's never been tried before, except it's never been tried before. Well, the last try. episode of Highlander comes to mind, but okay. <laughs> yeah, it's just, you know, it's just these people are, pardon my French here, folks, these people are bat shinola crazy. They are they are so enamored of their power and their agenda that that they come out with these insane ideas. And this is the problem, the, the other problem I see happening. Right now, Tina, we've got 65 volcanoes in the 65, count them. Mm. And they're all active right now. Yeah. All of, of them. Of course. Now, that means we could be in for something really major. What a perfect time to try and blot out the sun, eh? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, they also don't want us to eat or, or have fuel. That, too. They don't want any of that. <laughs> and, of course, but you, you can't explain to people. That, and, actually, we should be rejoiced because if you look at the actual, actual numbers, there are fewer people dead from climate change. It's been decreasing over the past 20 yes. years. Yes. Hallelujah. But there are, is a climate change going on. It's not man-made. But what do we need if there's an environmental change? We need cheap fuel. Yes. And what are they trying to take away? Cheap fuel. Cheap fuel. So if we have any crisis, we cannot weather it. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, as any politician will say, any cri don't never let a crisis go to waste. Go to waste. <clears throat> and if their idea is to push us into a World War III so they can be the left men standing in order to control what is left, I don't think that will work. I don't think they can do this. I don't think they can control that. Oh, I don't I don't either. Here, here's the fundamental problem. And, and uh, there are two different tracks to go down here, and they're both wildly different. The first track is, what's the answer to the following question? What's the maximum carrying capacity of planet Earth? What's, what's the maximum population? Well, the problem is, Tino, that that crazy Malthusian notion was first proposed long before Thomas Malthus by a, here it comes, folks, brace yourself, write this down, by a Venetian banker. <laughs> In the, I think it was the 16th or very early 17th century. And his maximum, he wrote a treatise on it. This, again, way before Malthus, a Venetian banker. <laughs> Re, repeat those words, folks. Back, Venetian banker. Back to them again. <laughs> yeah, back to them again. The maximum carrying capacity in his day was 1 billion people. 1 billion. I think he was wrong. I think, well, that's the point. <laughs> Technology changes. Yeah. These are not static systems. No one can give you an answer to that question because there isn't one. We don't know. If you look at if you look at the the surface of the planet, we we humans, the, we eight billion humans, actually take up a very small percentage of the surface of this planet. Yes. Very, yes. very small. Can... So that's problem number one. The and it's just a teensy weensy one. That's all well, I, and I forget what my other problem was, so we'll have to continue until I remember what <laughs> what was in my noggin when I. Prevagen, I, I recommend it highly. <laughs> <laughs> They always work. I just keep forgetting to take them. I just keep forgetting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Product placement. I'm expecting. What, what can I say? I'm getting old. You know? <laughs> uh, I got my I got my annual social security statement. If you retake your social security retirement this year, this is how much you get in benefits. And I'm thinking, do I trust this government at all? <laughs> <laughs> Answer no, <laughs> no. 
Well, it, 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 I think the British civil service was always an interesting sample for that. It was always that the British service, a civil service is there to facilitate the, the desires and wishes and policies of the new government. When in reality, no, it's not. It's no. there to continue doing what they want to do, what is the baseline, and to oppose uh, new new politicians coming in with new ideas. Not much different than here and everywhere else. You have a class of men, it's yes. the material class. So no matter who you vote for, whomever you put in a Muppet, you put in charge, they become docilized. Don't yes. know if it's a word, but we speak English, so it's a word. We made it up the end. Um, and they stop trying all their new ideas. And no. it seems to, and that seems to be the, the UN, the EU, the same thing. There's a whole, these people that are unelected that are making decisions that yeah. are extremely detrimental. And interestingly enough, most of them we don't know, and most of them don't have children. They don't have solid family lives, which is another interesting thing. And they all scream and shout about having to bring in all these uh, illegal immigrants, all these immigrants, because they have fewer and fewer, the birth rate is down in most Western countries. Of course it is, because you can't afford to have children in the West. Right. And for people who think clearly, right. they're going to stop having three, four kids because they can't afford it. Yeah. But if the concept of these globalists which is their activities or their wishes are borne out by these managerials. The idea is they want a docile workforce. And my thought is you want a docile workforce that you can control and you bring in some very religious people from Muslim countries. And one thing you can say about Muslims, not exactly docile. No. And I actually say that with a bit of reverence because they don't put up with anything. And he doesn't know you don't don't give them shit. So where's that docile workforce? They're just going to take over. They can't control them. Do they really? Is that what they thought they could control these people? Well, in a certain sense, I think that's that's the case because the the typical attitude of the modern Western progressive is that religion is for stupid dweebs, and you know we're so smart we can we can outthink them. The problem that these nutcases don't realize is is these religions have been around far longer than modern progressives, yes. and they've weathered virtually every kind of intellectual assault that you can think of. So, yeah. in other words, they they are quite the converse from what the popular imagination takes them to be. They are breeding grounds for real intellectuals. That's the other part of the problem. And when you're dealing with, with Islam, or in my case, Eastern Orthodoxy, you're dealing with religions that have no difficulty whatsoever with the idea of self-defense. Exactly. Um, and that's been bred out of mainstream Christianity here. And in, in the West, it, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's it's all of this. I don't know what it is, quite turn, frankly. <laughs> turn the other cheekism. It, it, it isn't even that, because these, it's like these people haven't cracked a New Testament in their lifetimes, other than maybe a modern translation, you know, where we get rid of all that crap. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's yeah, the well, Thomas we, Jefferson Bible. Here, let's take the scissors to all the stuff we don't like. The know. Bible rewritten by bureaucrats. The Bible is rewritten by... Well, you know, <laughs> Pope Francis wants to do this, and... You know how much how much is it going to take for people to wake up? So I think part of it is is this bureaucratic disdain or distaste for for religion and all the flyover people. Yes. And the and the problem is, the way I view it, Tino, the problem is we're fast approaching a point where. You know, Bismarck's old Bismarck's old warning was the next world war is going to be some damn fool thing in the in the Balkans, and you know it turned out that he was right. Such a peaceful well, place. Yeah, <laughs> but but you know, if we update if we update the Iron Chancellor a bit, it's it's going to be some damn fool thing in the United States that touches this off. Yeah. I I I. They are going to they are going to push to the point where people are going to have enough and and take things into their own hands. And this brings me to the the forgotten point that I had in the back of my head just a few minutes ago, because the current elite, the current leadership class, you know, 
thinks that they're going to be able to get into their hidey holes and their bunkers and ride out the storm. Yeah. Mr. Putin has some very bad news for them. And the bad news is called hypersonic change course missiles with bunker busters that he can drop right on their heads. That's the bad news. And the other bit of bad news is if you've been listening to the Russians carefully lately, they have been sending out warning after warning after warning. We didn't listen to them when, when they said, don't expand NATO into the Ukraine, and here we are. Yep. And now we're ignoring the next batch of warnings, and, and that batch of warnings is, we will target you if you do such and such. The munitions plant explosions in the United Kingdom, I am absolutely convinced, were Russian special operations. The munition plants explosions Germany. in Germany were probably Russian plant explosions. Yeah. Um, if, if the leadership class of this country thinks that they're going to be able to get away by trying to drop a few drones on the Kremlin or on Mr. Putin and so on and so forth. I've got bad news for you, Mr. Soros. They will do the same with you. We're, we're on the cusp, Tino, I think, of a complete breakdown in the normal international political order. We're looking at the possibility of real mafia wars. And the reason why we're looking at that possibility is that Russia is it has been talking about horizontal escalation. They do not want to escalate to the point of a military occupation of the Ukraine, much less a nuclear war with anybody. Yeah. What they're going to do is they're going to resort to... to Fifth column activity. To, to fifth column activity in the form of decapitation strikes. Yeah. That's what they're going to do. And, and we're just at the very beginning of it. Isn't it terrifyingly sad that being a fairly well-rounded, normal human being, as I have claimed that I am, I'm sitting here thinking, oh, gee, the Russians are going to get rid of all the Western leaders that's currently destroying my culture, my country, and everything else. Huh. I guess I'll have a drink and watch that happen. Yeah. I'm probably not going to put on a uniform and go try to help them because no. that's the other thing. This yeah. You have alienated everybody who was yes. capable and willing and patriotic to defend you. So right. now you're barreling out of Washington in your limousine and you have a flat tire and you're hoping that Billy Bob and his son, <laughs> the AR, is going to help you after you destroyed his business? I don't think so. And, and who are you relying on to fill up your military? <laughs> oh, Duncan. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Back to that. Uh, the whole the whole woke agenda. And how long is that military going to last fighting the Russians or the Iranians or the Chinese? You know, name your potential opponent. And how is a woke U.S. military going to fare against them? Probably not too well. And after pulling out of Afghanistan or leaving our allies the way we did, do we really? Are you expecting to send? anybody to Iran to go fight them for for you? For no. what, for why? No. And the, here's an interesting statistic. Well, the, the recruitment statistics are, as you know, down dramatically. Gee, golly, I wonder why. Gee, I'm surprising that uh, Billy Bob <laughs> and his son doesn't want to sign up to the recruitment ad with Becky grew up in California with her two mothers, a perfectly normal uh, existence. She wants to be a fighter pilot. Gee, I wonder why. You are, and I, you're actively recruiting to people who do not want to. And I'll tell you the recruitment numbers, since apparently I, I work at Stratcom and I have to look at this. <laughs> the recruitment numbers for women have been an even steady 10% for the past 20, 30 years. It doesn't go up, it doesn't go down. It is what it is. Um, the recruitment in white guys have now dropped. And the numbers we're not filling are white men whose families fought, whose grandparents fought. And but we're like about 40,000 low in the army now. The navies and the air force are starting to close down units because they can't fill them. And here's the interesting thing of all the men that fell in battle or got wounded in Afghanistan, 73% of those were white guys. Yes. 
So the people who are actually putting their arse on the line, there's also black soldiers and Asian under this. This is not this. Look at the bigger picture. Uh, no, no offense. There's there's plenty of others, but the people who we are not backfilling the military with are the ones who who are traditionally out front fighting, getting right. killed. So what are you going to do here? And well, the other the other solution is the old you know solution that the Western Roman Empire tried, and and that's what it looks like to me that part of this. Uh, immigration, you know, open borders thing is yeah. just fill it up with mercenaries, and that works so well for the Western Roman Empire. <laughs> well, if you're gonna, okay, if we're gonna take that the, the the line to the Civil War in America, because everyone's, we are. It, it's interesting because Civil War statistically, um, ha it happens when the income equality is too great and the wages and competition for good jobs. Uh, is way too low. And interesting enough, when the average age of marriage is above 28, then the chance of civil war is there. And we fulfill all of these today. Yep. So yep. are we pulling people in? Because if you're going to have a civil war, let's say uh, Biden and co nut job, they decide that we're going to wage war on, on the... We're going to deny Trump his victory. We're going to start civil war, declare uh, martial law, blah, blah, blah. Um, are they going to call up the military? Most of the military, the sergeants, the lieutenants, the, they're patriotic people. They're not going to go against the American people. But right. if you fill up the American military with immigrants right. who have loyalty to who gave them their green card, right. they might turn weapons against. Right. I mean, the, right. the leadership will forget about them because they're political appointees. We all know what way they swing. We need to remember that this, the phenomenon that you're describing is, is part of the experience of, of the first war between the states. Because we need to remember that both the Union and the Confederacy, the Union particularly, brought in waves of German immigrants, and many of them ended up in the Union Army. Well, why? Well, the 1848 revolution in, in Europe had failed. Many Germans were involved in that. They came to this country in the aftermath of all of that. And as a result, you know, you had a bunch of radicals basically imported into Abraham Lincoln's army. So, you know, and that sets up its own little list of, of post-bellum problems. So, in other words, this what you're describing is not out of out of the picture at all. It's very definitely in play, I think. And yeah. and the problem is right now, the way I see it, is that this election is uh, they they have you know we're dealing with one party that in the last three pardon me, election cycles, has basically staged coups, coups d'etat. Yeah. And, against you know, their own. Against their own, yeah. precisely. Hillary against uh, Senator Sanders, and then, you know, this whole Biden-Joe fiasco. Strasbourg, Tavares. Yeah, Strasbourg, yeah, or whatever the Chinese Mandarin equivalent is. Right. And, yeah. and now we have, you know, now we have Kamalarchy, and it's the whole thing is just nuts. So mm. we're in the midst of an existential election. And this is my worry that yeah. regardless of who wins, some hothead out there is not going to like the result and start problems. That's my worry. Oh, no matter who wins, we're guaranteed that some moron is not going to agree. Some and since moron. We, have, we have whipped up the division in this country Yes. Falsely, we have divided this country. The media has, when somebody says the media is the enemy of truth and the people, they're not wrong. Because if the media had called everything honestly down the line, yep. uh, we would have had a very different, uh, and it, it, it's almost like it's a mass psychosis on one side. Because now I, I remember three or four weeks ago, I, I clearly remember three or four weeks ago when everyone says they have got to get rid of Kamala because she's oh, like, yeah. The nut job. She's terrible. We can't. We can't have Biden drop out because she's this horrible person. And then a week later, she's the best thing since God. Are you kidding me? <laughs> well, she's much better than God. She's goddess. Yeah. She's she's the sacred feminine. Come on. Wait, I remember the. I, I have and the thing. I have remember seeing when Biden put her in charge of the border. I said by some I, reporters. I remember and then, that too. Yes. Another the same reporter will say that never happened. I'm yeah, like, wait. So, and the, the problem is, now, you and I are fairly well random people. There are people who, like Jim Morris says, don't believe your lying eyes. Now, I remember my lying eyes said they saw this, so I know I saw it. I'm not questioning myself that. I'm not senile yet. 
But there are people who also know that they saw this. They know this, and they have decided to suspend their disbelief and not believe what they saw. Yeah, because they don't like Trump so much that we must believe the other thing. Yeah, That's it's, terrifying. It, it's, it's, it's the same <clears throat> sort of phenomenon that we're watching take place in this country that has been a study, part of sociological studies of the Soviet Union. Yeah. That people know that the propaganda that Tass and, and Pravda are putting out was complete BS. And nevertheless, they just chose to go along with it because it was easier to do that yeah. than believe the truth. Until the whole system came crashing down. It, you know, the lies simply piled on top of more lies and it could not be sustained. I think we're we're right at that point. I think I think the the modern American propotainment media, as I like to call it, is is at the point where a certain segment of society is going to believe the lies and another segment of society has just totally walked away from them. Yeah. So we're seeing what we're seeing again, this is very important to stress. What we're seeing again is a cultural cosmological divide in this country of two mutually exclusive cultures and cosmologies Yes, that are here. It comes that are what they're held together by a common government and gosh i wonder if that doesn't resemble something that this country has been through before in its history oh do share think well think of those think of those self-righteous morally crusading new england yankees and those southern self-righteous plantation and slave owners and you've got a mixture that is quite explosive and all you need to set off the fuse is the election of a candidate who represents one section over the other yeah. after a series of weak presidents yes we're at we're at the james buchanan abraham lincoln jefferson davis moment of history once again folks that's where we're at i, I was thinking even further back i was thinking back to the puritans who came so oh, deep yeah. in their belief system now we have we're back to the mass psychosis we have yes. one side and some yes. parts of the other that are now so deep rooted in what they believe it is a religion yeah. Cultural Marxism is well, that, that's what I that's what I mean by by the New England Yankees. Yes. It's, it's that yes. Puritan influence that that becomes secularized with Ralph Waldo Emerson and the Unitarians and yeah. all of that crap that takes over the radical abolitionists and you know becomes the Republican Party. <laughs> Let's face it, that's what it was. <laughs> so you know, um, with with Honest Abe, the railroad lawyer, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no financial collusion there, folks. <laughs> you can and, trust oh, by the way, and by the way, Jeff Davis, former former Secretary of War, who did what during his tenure as Secretary of War? Well, he scouted out routes for a trans transcontinental southern route railroad, is what he was doing. <laughs> so, you know, have we been here before? Yes, we yeah. have. <laughs> So, so what's the way out of this? Because, and and people that they, it's it's interesting because people they always well they don't believe oh the press they're not all that bad but the, the, the global media ninety percent is owned by a handful of people when you boil down to the entities so it's not it's not very hard to see where the prop how to control the propaganda you own the internet you own the media you have a few teeny weeny outlets where people actually try to speak freely and you try to shut them down in the greater good of whatever it is they're trying to do. It's not hard to explain how you and see it because you have an American politician will make one statement, but you, sometimes you, you see the flow that went out to, <clears throat> right, but Kamala is a good, um, is, a, is a very good um, sample because when the day after she was announced, a, me a brief went out to all media to deny that she was the border star and was several all the talking points all media took those talking points up immediately mm -hmm. you have the same thing abroad you will have whether with the un reset and their nonsense if there's a brief that goes out it goes out to all media you see it in england you see it 
all of a sudden, all countries, media, mass media, come out with the same statement, the mm -hmm. same wording at the same time. Mm -hmm. So there is some global, uh, there must be a global cabal controlling the direction of their mass loony ship. Mm -hmm. Who are these people again? <laughs> because that's well, that <clears throat> what's the hard for people to believe. You've asked, but it must be. you've asked two questions. What do we do about it? And who's who is this global cabal? So what do we do about it? And here is an answer that nobody's going to like, but I think it's absolutely essential to say. Figure out now. Figure out now what you are willing to die for. Notice what I just said. Not what you're willing to kill for, what you're willing to die for. Because yeah. we are at that moment of, of existential crisis in this culture, like it or not. Yeah. So I'm just being honest with everybody. You're absolutely correct. Once you've figured that out, then the next thing I would say is, is we need to thoroughly revive our local connections and networks yeah uh we need to we need to think long term and strategically about the kind of culture we want to preserve and then to see flourish uh we need to make every sort of conceivable plan for doing all of the above and quite frankly i think if you look at what is happening at the state level in several American states. Mm -hmm. It's as if the deep state version within each of those several states already is seeing the handwriting on the wall and they're making long-term plans for the big crack up. Yeah. That's what they're doing. That's the way I view the bullion depositories, the constitutional money issues and resolutions at state legislatures. They're doing this because they see the crack up coming. How about Europe? Because I think in the same thing. Same thing. In, Europe's, in Europe's case, what you're seeing, what you've seen in the last two decades is something very interesting to me. Number one, you had the gold repatri repatriation craze, which began with who? Germany. Oh, yes. They wanted their money back. They wanted their money back. And I thought at the time, really? I thought, golly, I wonder why that is. Maybe it has something to do with what Hjalmar Schacht wrote in his memoirs back when he was president of the old Reichsbank. Remember that? Yes. <laughs> he came over to this country and visits his friend Benjamin Strong, the governor of, uh, general of the, of the New York Federal Reserve, which is the bank of accounts for the American federal government, and therefore the bank of accounts that handles its international clearing with the foreign mm -hmm. banks. So here's Hjalmar Schacht. And, and Strong, and they're going down into the gold vaults, and Schacht asks Strong uh, to see the Reichsbank gold. And so all the little aides scurry away, and they come back and report to Strong that they can't find it. Mm -hmm. And this is in Schacht's memos, folks. And this I've is in 30, 33, 34... 30, uh, 28, I think it was. 28, 20, yeah. Yeah, or... Earlier, it's before the Nazis have taken yes. power. And Schacht's comment at that point in his memoirs to me are just, this is so classic. And it's classic Schacht. Yep. He just kind of smiles and looks at Strong and says, that's okay. I know you're good for it. <laughs> I know. And I'm thinking maybe this had a little something to do with him getting off so lightly at Nuremberg, you know. Oh, <laughs> he, was... he could have blown the whole thing wide open. So anyway, don't mess with the German Reichsbank president. So anyway, Germany wants to repatriate its gold. And and you know, I had I had a friend in Germany at the time that was following all this. So they get a bunch of the gold back, and then and then the people that were behind the repatriation back to the Bundesbank are saying that the Bundesbank doesn't want to do any assays of the gold that they just got to find out if it's... <laughs> if it's e gold? Good 
Yeah, <laughs> it's really bullion quality gold. So on and on this goes. So that you know that's problem number one. Um, I mean, it is really annoying when you find all that dental lead in your gold. Well, yeah, but here's the problem: the, this this movement spread very quickly in Europe, and people forget this. Austria, within a matter of weeks, then the Netherlands. Yeah, you know. And I'm thinking, and right about this time, you see the very beginnings of all this populist stuff beginning to happen. AFD in Germany, a few a few months after the repatriation gets its start. And the same thing in, in Hungary, the same thing in Austria, which elected that populist chancellor for the first time, you know, that kid. Uh, and yeah. so all of this was going on. And I'm thinking, okay, whatever's going on in Europe, it's going to take, it's it's going to be the same thing as going on over here, but it's got to manifest itself differently. They do it differently in Europe. They do it differently. They do it quieter. Yeah. Here we will have some uh, occasional context. We'll go out on the wall. She'll scream and shout, this is what we're going to do. We're going to take guns. We're going to destroy this or the other. In Europe, you just wake up and realize the vacuum cleaner you bought yesterday is now illegal. Right. Um, well, what, what they do in Europe is the Dutch farmers, you know, get their tractors out or the German farmers or the French farmers get their tractors and dump uh, manure on government office buildings, you know, a, a wonderful French way to address the problem. <laughs> <laughs> it's not worth losing your head over. It's not, it's just not worth losing your head <laughs> over. But no, I, you know, this, this is something I think that, that we're watching in Europe and I, you know, we're not watching the end of it. It's, it's by no means over. This is if, just barely if Starmer thinks he's gonna if he thinks he's gonna cap it by throwing a bunch of people in jail. Uh uh. Ah, now you have political prisoners, basically. You, yes, you're creating political prisoners in their own country. Yeah, that that does. That's and, not a good strategy. And when you have blacks and whites and uh, Jews and Hindis that are marching together because they don't want their little girls killed, and they're yes. all labeled as right wing Nazis. Not a. This is not. This is not a good propaganda market. At least the Jewish guy in that crowd would be a little offended. It's just, you know, it yeah, it's just you, you cannot label everything you don't like a Nazi. It doesn't work anymore. It doesn't work. Is yeah, it like your problem of number one? <laughs> <laughs> language they, they first they steal our words our language so we can't use it and then they abuse it to the point where it no longer has meaning for us and then right. Right. well sorry uh but i thought it was very interesting what happened at the last the, the hundred uh, different protests that was announced by of course the right wing nut job <clears throat> as they were claimed to be as a, but they caught on because they knew they were being set up because they had all the counter protests and all the police were going to show up to arrest the, the let's call them the right wingers because I don't know what else to call them, patriotic Britons. And they didn't show up. None of them showed up. They just realized they stayed home. And then, and then the MI5 said, well, they uncovered a plot by ultra nationalists to destroy, to, to destroy Britain by staying home. I saw the headline like what? By staying home and okay, the British, the British are learning. To me, it's fascinating to watch this, yeah. Tina, because the British are learning the lessons that the East Germans went through and learned. And that is, yeah, you can use your cell phones to communicate, but if you want to communicate with each other without the Stasi listening in. You do it by direct word of mouth, and you know the person to whom you're communicating information yeah. to, and they will in turn pass it through the network. This is exactly how East Germany lost control of East Germany. Yeah. <laughs> you know, with a little help from Chancellor Kohl. And this is this to me is fascinating to watch in the United Kingdom because that's exactly what you see going on. And that's one of the things is a lesson for here. And yes, it's a lesson for here. And while while this is happening in the United Kingdom, there's been another political earthquake in that country. And and people don't realize the significance of this. Nigel mm -hmm. Farage was elected on I forget the name of his party, but he was elected on on a party ticket 
when the party had only been formed a few weeks earlier. Now, if you know anything about British electoral politics and how difficult yeah. that is to do, yes, that's an earthquake. Because now you have somebody that's not a member of the Tory establishment and is not a member of the Labour establishment sitting in Parliament, able to put any question he wants during Prime Minister's questions. And I'm waiting with bated breath to see how they're going to handle that. Because if they try and stifle him, that only makes their own chances go down. We're at a wonderful Benjamin Disraeli, Prime Minister Gladstone moment of history here. <laughs> I just, I feel it a coming, folks. Well, they, they might try to stop him because Lord knows everything they have done to address this have been opposite of what they should have done. So Yes. And well, it is only worse. Well, yes, the... the Again, these global loonies are blockheads. They're stupid. Yes. They, they, you know, look what happened in Italy. They tried to stop that populism stuff in Italy, and it just grew and got worse. So now what have they got? They've got a prime minister that's cozying up to Syria. <laughs> you know? I mean, we're back to the common sense again. Yeah, we're back to, yeah, a little common sense from Italy. <laughs> Okay, so oh, wow, yeah, that's kind of scary. yeah, that yeah, <laughs> you gotta let that one sink in, you know, and it's gonna get worse and worse and worse. These the problem is these global lunias have have surrounded themselves. I think Tino for so I, I was warning about this way back with George Ann Hughes decades, yes, a decade and a half ago. Yeah. These people have surrounded themselves with their own yes men for so long they cannot think outside their own box anymore. They are stupid. This yes. is why people are abandoning them in in droves. That is what it seems like. My name is Tino Struckman. I run Lost Battlefields. Every year I travel around the world to try to bring you to all the most interesting historical military locations for modern wars and World War II special projects, battlefields, forts, fortresses and tunnels, everything else. Things you may not be able to see or go to yourselves, please join me on Patreon or join Lost Battlefields through the website so you get access to all my files and my notes. It really does help and like, follow, share here on the channel. If you can, that helps too.